Uh, sometime in the late eight, uh, sometime in the eighties, a man named Abdullah Ochalan started a group called the PKK. It's a, it was a, at the time started off as a Marxist group that was going to fight for Kurdish liberation in autonomous Kurdistan. So the PKK was in like northern Kurdistan, Turkey. Started fight the PKK started fighting Turkey. Somehow this rebel group was going to overthrow Turkey, which is gigantic and a part of the north and like NATO. Like, okay, um, good luck. Um, PKK is still, still around. Um, Abdul Ochalan is now in jail. He's on an island in Turkey um, in exile. He, he was going to get killed, but Turkey wanted to join the EU. And he said, if you want to be a part of the EU, Turkey, you've got you to go not have the death penalty anymore. So that kind of saved Abdul Ochalan's life. He still writes books. And then a group split, uh, split it off called the PJAC, and they fight Iran. And so they're fighting for Kurdish liberation. And I'm not, I'm not a fan of these groups. I'm not saying they do good things. Um, but a lot of the Kurdish people, especially in the mountainous regions today, they're the only people sticking up for us. Um, so now, that me, now I've told you all this, what is CBT's role in all of this? So CBT is based on the Sulaymaniyah, which is fair, it's pretty far away from the border regions. Uh, there's never really um, any violence, like there's not really any bombings there from Turkey or Iran. There, have, there has been quite a bit of violence from like, the police um, repressing the Kurdish folks. Uh, the Kurdish people have Kurdish leaders, but the Kurdish people recognize the power of corrupts, and even though they have a Kurd, Kurdish person leading them, that doesn't mean that person's not going to be corrupt. There's a lot of corruption in the KRG. So, <coughs> CPT's role, we do focus on the bombings of Turkey and Iran. Um, some of the bombings that have happened recently, uh, about a week after I arrived in, uh, in Iraq, in Kurdish Iraq, it was during Ramadan, uh, some Turkish fighter jets were near Rani, about 45 minutes across the border, in, into Kurdish area, and they bombed a truck that, for some reason, they thought was PKK or PJAC. It wasn't. It was a family of seven, including a 10-month-old girl, a 10-month-old baby, and then everybody in that truck died. And so that was, that, that was my second week, and we were invited to the funeral, so we went to the funeral and participated in it, and then we interviewed some people from the area to get the story of what happened, who, like, who were these people, put it, and try to put a face to these, and put a, yeah, face and name to these these casualties. I mean, it was, I think, some like on the news a little bit, but you know, if you get the news, it's going to be like at the bottom. It's not going to be a headline story. It doesn't, it doesn't really say much about it. And generally, it does say, you know, Tur the U.S. says, whoops, sorry, but we, we back we back Turkey because they're our allies, and yada, yada, yada. So, and then recently, just right before New Year's Eve, uh, along the mountain, the mountain, like along the mountains of Turkey, near, uh, the KRG, there's a group of teenagers that, um, people smuggle stuff along the borders. They smuggle stuff into Iran, back and forth, and they smuggle stuff back in Turkey. And it's known, it's not a real big deal, you know, smuggle cigarettes, because you can get a pack of cigarettes for 50 cents in the carriage and for six bucks in Turkey, so. They're smuggling. Well, there's a group of them, and then Turkey bombed them, and they're a little, somewhere, you haven't heard, I haven't heard one definite report yet, but somewhere between 30 to 36 teenagers were killed. Um, this time, I mean, a lot of times, Turkey will say, oh, look, the seven that were killed in Iranian, Turkey said, well, we haven't, we haven't confirmed it. We don't even know, if, we don't really even know if it was civilians or not. That might have been PKK, so then they're not even apologizing for that. This, they had their hands tied, they had to apologize for that, but they're not really, besides that, it's just an apology. And, and, and the Turkey's uh, rhetoric in the past few months is that we're going to wipe out the PKK, we're going to kill them all. Turkey is Turkey, we're a big country, we're not going to let these Kurdish folks push us around anymore. So CPT, uh, what we do mostly is human rights abuse documentation and ad advocacy. Uh, there's not like, the, like the, the everyday walk the kid to school like Palestine does. It's a lot of collecting data and information and compiling some into reports, and then uh, pressuring local governments to do do certain things. Um, and then a lot of meetings with the UN and other human rights uh, human rights groups like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, which are bigger and more people know about. Uh, yeah, and it's like in this region, there's not very many like nonprofits that do this kind of work. Um, so, like what I was I was telling you about. Uh, publication we put out a couple years ago, I think it's late 2009 or sometime in 2010, called Where There Is Hope, There Is Tragedy. Um, that's, that was a statement from somebody we knew in a village called Perta Hausa. And they said a lot of people, like government officials, would come to their villages and listen to their stories and say, yeah, that's terrible, you know. Uh, you're, you, had to let, you had to leave your village and go to this in, internal displacement camp. Well, we're gonna, what we'll do is we'll send like a hot water heater and 30 tents and some food. And then people will be like, oh great, you know, maybe we'll be able to get to winter. And then it turns out the government will send like half or whatever. Mm -hmm. So every time there's something, every time there's hope, they're let down over and over again. <coughs> uh, when I was in Iraq, 
uh, the first month and a half, two months, we participated in a lot of demonstrations on the streets. Earlier in 2010, yeah, like when after like the revolution in Egypt happened, you know, everything spreading to the Middle East. Well, it would be right to call it the Arabic Spring because Kurds are Arabic, so you could say like the Kurdish Spring or the Kurdish March in April. And so they were they were protesting against uh, corruption in Karachi, and it went on for about 62 days. And eventually, eventually the police started shooting folks. Uh, one time they were outside of a local political party uh, headquarters, and the political parties in the Karachi are more like tribes, really like they have their own militias. And so depending on an area, if, like the, if this group's in charge, their militia is going to be the police and the army there. Uh, but they don't fight each other, like with guns, they just argue. But they, so there's a group of protesters outside of the building where they were, uh, they were protesting, and somebody threw a rock from the building that was set. Somebody threw a rock from the building, so somebody from the street picked up a rock, and said, well, you know what, I'll throw it right back at you. And that opened up the floodgates, and then four people with machine guns started shooting into the crowds and killed people. Um, so CPT started going to the CPT had been going to these protests every day, trying to be there with the idea that when there's violence going on, if there's an international presence there, there's the, the, the chance of violence is less likely because there's a, uh, accountability. Uh, one man we knew, a guy named Carl Watt, he's a lawyer, a really great guy, smartest guy I ever I met. Um, he's really funny. He spoke really good English, and he made me want to learn Kurdish because he would say you mix in his Kurdish and English really well. And, uh, he, sounded, he should be like a radio DJ, he sounded really cool, but um, one day he was, at a, he was at a protest and he's walking to his car and he sees a man that's in traditional Kurdish garb and the guy has a gun and he uh, shoots him in the leg and, uh, and the car one manages to kind of like hobble off and then the guy runs to his car, gets in the car and drives off and they take him to the hospital and the car one got there, they didn't like call anybody, they didn't call the police or anybody, but then there like a lot of police showed up and like, we heard there was a shooting. And there's a lot of circumstances that led to look like it was a, it was, it was like an assassination attempt by like, somebody in the police or the government had like had, had ordered that. So Carwan was uh, attempted assassination. He said we're not really sure if it was an attempted assassination. He shot him in the leg. It might have been like a scare tactic. But ever since his family has been harassed, there's been a lot of rumors. Um, somebody had got on Facebook and found his mom's Facebook and sent her, sent her a really nasty message about Carwan and being involved with a married woman. Which in the U.S. isn't nice, but in Kurdistan will get you killed because it's an honor, like, honor and shame society. Um, so he's trying to, him and his fiance, it was just so wonderful, they're trying to get out of the country so he doesn't die. So while I was there, me and Carwan sat, we talked a lot, we talked to different people in Canada, so trying to get him refugee status. So that was one of the aspects of what we did, and that was kind of fulfilling, hopefully, he'll be able to move somewhere else and practice law. Um, and then the last month when we were in, when we were in Iraq, we were uh, in October, we traveled a lot to villages around, like the, the, around the, mount, the mountainous area of Turkey and Iran, um, interviewing and taking pictures. Um, and then went from that, we started interviewing and collecting data from in Suleimani, the city we're at. Some of, these, some of the folks that we worked with in Suleimani, some of our partners, have said, you know, we we wanted to compile people's attitudes about the war or about these bombings. But anytime we do, the police show up and tell us, don't do that. And they, they threaten us. So will you do it? Yeah, yeah, that's, you know, I mean, like, a lot of times people think it's, like, really exciting work, and, like, one side, it really built it up, thinking, like, tens of thousands of people are going to, are going to die, and, you know, we're some people expected me, like, in the middle of battlefields, like, pulling our kids, standing in front of a tank, but, um, I'm kind of thankful I didn't get to do that, but, I mean, it was, I guess it made for good stories, but, um, so we, so we took, uh, collected a lot of data, interviewed people, and compiled a survey, and just, and they just, it was just published a week ago. Uh, explaining the attitudes of civilians in Suleimani, uh, talking about how they feel about the bombings of Iran and Turkey. Um, and one of the things we, we made sure to do was um, it was pretty it was split down the middle, gender, uh, gender-wise. Usually on the street, and that was hard work. Usually on the streets when we go to coffee shops, it's full of men, and women wouldn't generally wouldn't talk to men. And so that was something we're really proud of. And then we've been publishing that and sending it out to government, like local government agencies, and trying to explain to the government like. Um, you can say whatever you want, but what people say, but we have this, like we have, we've spoken with them, people are against us, we should think it's, like everybody knows that, but the, 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 the government's just kind of like, well, you know, it's, it's bad, but, you know, we're not sure what we should do, and yada, yada, yada. So, so, I mean, people spoke to the survey saying, uh, Turkey and Iran have no right to cross our borders at all, let alone bomb, and what we want the KRG to do is this, 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 and this, and this, and so, it's pretty, it's been, a, it's been, a, it's pretty exciting, it's made it, that story, CPT is not a very big deal, like, in, like as far as like, globally, but CPT like has been in the news quite a bit with that recently, and that's pretty exciting. Um, 
And I mean, that's, that's a big part of what we do, and we miss a lot of awesome people. One of my favorite stories is, I guess it would be all right to wrap it up now. Okay, so one of my favorite, um, one of my favorite times was we were near this, we were near a village in Ronnie, and it was that village I talked about in the children's story where the village, the last village that had a, we, we could drive to. And we were there, and I ran, had, had done some shelling, and this, like, they used a special type of shell that would blow up midair and just send like, shrapnel everywhere. And so, like their houses would have, like, their roofs would have holes in them, their windows were all blown out. And we're, the guy we're with is named Kaka Osman. Kaka is like a, a brother or a sir of Mr. And Kaka Osman is this really nice guy. He like, sat us down, had, had to give us lunch any time we showed up. And um, he built his house, he rebuilt his house four times. And each time, I mean, he was, he was almost like making it nicer and nicer. And I was explaining to somebody, like, in a way, like, that is resistance. I use the word resistance in a good way. I don't mean it as, like, fighting. Um, but he was, he was telling us, he was like, you know, a lot of folks in our village have left. And um, we want, I mean, we kind of want to leave. But I love this land. It's been in the past generations, for eight generations. They don't even know how old the village is because they don't really care. They just know, oh, my, it's been in the family for eight, uh, my generation, my, my family's been here eight generations. So we're not leaving. I love this land. We're not leaving. And... Not long after that, some more people showed up and we did and we did uh, like introductions. And I got to my chair and I was sitting next to him and I said, well, I'm from Oklahoma, the United States. And he looked at me and this and this I felt the best about one of the best feelings. He looked at me and through translation he said, No, you're not from the US, you're from Kurdistan now. And I kinda like looked at him smiling, yeah, 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 yeah. And like, I don't even know what he said that he might have been saying I'm lying, but but yeah, so if you look on the CPT's website under the frequently asked questions, something I didn't look at until after I joined was that. Probably what we do most is drink tea. We spend time and we build relationships. And that's what CPT does. And it's still an, ex it's an experiment, like I said. And we drink a lot of tea. We meet a lot of people. And hopefully, as Gene Stolz said, our founding director said, hopefully there's less violence in the world as a result of CPT being around. So that's CPT. Uh, I thank you for letting me come and share it.